Italian. Mrs. Clark's spaghetti tastes meta met. But here comes the Sorzione, 100% premium pasta from Ranzoni. There's fettuccine, rotelli, linguini. Enjoy them up fresco without bread. And taste the difference 70 years of Italian know-how can make. Now you can say, Ranzoni sono buono. Ranzoni is so good. Al came to one of our programs and he introduced himself to me. And this is Alfred Ranzoni, of course, that I'm speaking of. And I said, really? Ranzoni is so no more? Ranzoni is so good. Right. We all grew up with that jingle in our heads, right? I said, and I remember how we had him to give us his story, the Ranzoni story, which is our story. So, Without further ado, I introduce you to Alfred Gonzoni, the great dancer. Let's get set up tonight. This uh, location has very special significance because it's within walking distance of where Emmanuel Ranzoni, my great grandfather, had his very first venture on Canal Street. So you're sitting, standing not too far from where he embarked on, on his journey. And tonight what I'm going to do is share with you my journey of personal discovery of this ancestor who I never knew. I never had a chance to meet him, but I feel I've come to know a lot better from speaking to uh, family members and learning about him. How did Ranzoni come to become such a well-recognized brand name? I, I've gotten that question from a lot of people already tonight. What is the story behind this familiar name in the red, white, and blue box? Uh, according to a genealogy compiled by my cousin Marie Zazzo, the earliest ancestor we know of is Pietro Ranzoni, who married Ermila Lorenzelli. And their child, Romano Ubaldo Ranzoni, my great-great-grandfather, was born in Parma in 1848. Uh, at some point after that, I'm not sure when, the Ranzoni family moved to the uh, coastal region of Liguria, the same region that Christopher Columbus was from. Okay. Not long after arriving in America, Emmanuel got his first job as what they called a helper in a macaroni factory in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And he made a salary of about $2 a week, which, you know, when I first did this, it was uh, worth about $40 in today's money. So that actually was probably some help to his family in those days, because the dollar went a lot further than what he does. There was little or no law regulating child labor in New York City at the time. But there were government expect inspectors, uh, you know, they did come around occasionally. So another story I got from my uncle was that he used to be hidden under a crate or a barrel yeah. when they used to come by. <laughs> After about 10 years or so, at age 22, he had learned enough about the business and saved enough money to go into business uh, on his own with a partner. And he started a small company in a loft near Canal Street. And after modest success, he decided to risk his entire savings in joining with two new partners to form the Atlantic Macaroni Company. And this company relocated to Vernon Boulevard in Long Island City in 1895. And we have a pamphlet here cover. So our next slide will show you what the Atlantic Macaroni Company was. I love the artwork on this. Is it, this we've just gotten started with this, so uh, prepare yourselves. Here we have a slide of the back of the factory, of the back of the pamphlet. Oh, actually, that's a blow up of the pamphlet. And then the next one is the back, which had its own mill pamphlet. Uh, okay, Manuel was in charge of production of Atlantic macaroni for 19 years. We're now going to take a look at several slides showing aspects of that company's operations because they nicely illustrate the type of machines and processes used at the time. First, we have the executive office, and I think that's great grandfather there. These are the two partners. I don't know anything about them. I don't know what their names are or anything. That's uh, going to have to wait for the research. Next slide is the laboratory testing room. There he is again, great grandfather. Now, when I worked at Ranzonia, I, I first started out, one of my first day there, they gave me one of those hats with a net on top and a little t-shirt that says Ranzonia, and they, I, I swear to God, they gave me a dust tail on the broom and they told me to go sweep around the outside. 
But I was getting union wages to do that, and it cost out of it. And the other thing that used to happen there is, uh, and this is the God's honest truth, that we, they would lay out several pots of pasta and pick different boxes at random, uh, and then my father would come up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and he would do a taste test every day. So when we used to say in those commercials, there's always one zoning washing the pot, it was true. <laughs> Next, this is the hydraulic press room. Now these machines are how they used to make pasta by what was called a batch by batch method, where they would stir up the dough in a vat with a machine called a gramel over the wheel. They would like roll around and stir up the dough. And then they would pour it at the top of these machines and uh, the hydraulics would press it down to the bottom. You can see the pasta coming out there and then they cut it off and that's the way they used to make it. And they would hang it out to dry. Great pictures, right? Yeah. yeah. And the really wild ones are still coming. All right, next. This is the guy with the Napoleon complex, I call this guy. Very apropos for Bastille Day. And if you know your Italian history, you know how important the French Revolution was for the subsequent events in Italy regarding the Risorgimento. French Revolution, very powerful impact. So I always love that picture. Wheat break rolls for okay, what these machines did is they break down the kernel of wheat so you get the semolina that they make out of macaroni. Different I'm not an expert on this, but there's different parts of the wheat kernel and what we wanted to get to is the semolina, so these machines would break that down. Next we have a packaging room where they're letting that pasta dry and then they're gonna put it in big boxes. So I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. More packing, <coughs> more packing, and more packing. Now, just just a little bit about this. The way that they used to, in these days, the way they used to sell macaroni is they would put it in these big boxes, and they would take it to like the corner store, and then they used to have drawers, and they would pour the pasta into the drawers. It wasn't weren't individual packaging. They didn't have that in those days. This is a, a historical society. We love this picture so much. It's up on our Ronzoni exhibit at the Historical Society. It's, it's such a homey image. You know, this, this is in a factory. These people are eating lunch. Uh, that I'm not sure about. I don't know who I would ask. I don't know if my father can answer that question. Edge running mill. I believe this is how they used to make the Spanish style noodles. Yes, that's right. Spanish style. We're gonna, I'm going to show you a shape chart in a little while. This is a different Powerful double dough break for noodles. Perfection breaker cutter and fold, especially constructed for, I think that's Bologna style, or Bologna style. Uh, examples of that would be bow ties and fettuccine in Bologna style. Again, hydraulic presses for Genoa style. Genoa style uh, includes fancy folded styles like lasagna. And here we have the 20th century super dreadnought perpendicular type hydraulic press, this monster. And does anybody know where that term dreadnought comes from? I don't know any prizes, but if you can answer the question, you know. The ships. There you go, very good. The, the, the HMS dreadnought was the most powerful battleship developed by the British around 1904. So obviously, you know, they're, they're making a linkage here with this monster of a hydraulic press machine. Here's one of the labels. Now, Atlantic Macaroni did brand products under its own name. The, the box didn't say Atlantic Macaroni. They used to tap into these different cultural trends and popular figures, just like you know, a lot of businesses do today. Uh, and they use a lot of different styles, as we'll see, to try to market the macaroni. One of them, this is the biggest singing star of, of his time, basically. All right, then we have another box of Caruso there. We also have Big Chief Macaroni. Uh, Lucia. Sona, there's a whole bunch of them there. I just love the artisticness of these uh, box labels. Uh, these, these are bulk packaging labels. These are the ones that went on those big boxes that they used to send to the corner store. Fantastic imagery. All right, so now we're up to the point where after 20 years working with Atlantic Macaroni, he'd saved up enough money and he decided to strike out on his own. Uh, and market a product under his own name for the first time. He opened a small plant on 35th Street in Northern Boulevard, once again in Long Island City. My next question for people is, what is it? That's the symbol of. 
Switzerland. No, same correct. <laughs> that is the coat of arms of the House of Savoy, the Italian ruling family. They ruled Italy from, United Italy from 1878 to 1946, I think, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright, uh, well, let's look at some of the latest. Aren't these incredible? Yeah. <laughs> Who made the labels? That I don't know. They, my guess is they probably farmed that out to a, you know, a printing farm or something like that. Okay, that's the family. Let's see what the name everybody for you. Uh, from left. Daughter, Marie. Grandmother, Teresa Capella. Wife, Maria Gar Garvin, Garbarino, children. Uh, yeah, Angelo, my grandfather, Emmanuel Jr., my uncle, and Raymond, the youngest one, also my uncle. And uh, the girl that's called Catherine. The writing and everything that, that we're most familiar with, and that was developed probably sometime in the 1920s. By the mid-1920s, the increasing volume of business required new and large quarters, and the construction of a new factory was begun on Long Island City, several blocks east of the original plant. Um, again, we see some different imagery here. Uh, they're, they're tapping into like American and Italian, so I see that, trying to blend those two together, which I think is very powerful. My understanding is I think Marie, Ronzoni, who and, and, and the daughters are the first ones to work with the great grandfather, not, not the sons because they were older. She designed that, uh, that symbol. Uh, close up. Yeah. What was trademark? The symbol or the macaroni itself? Uh, the trademark is this writing and all this stuff. Okay. I see the eagle. Okay. Right there's there's the plants. That's that yeah. plant I was telling you about. Yeah. You recognize that? In the Stanwood Street? This building still stands today. I, it's called oh, the lighthouse today. So this building still exists. Northern Boulevard. I'll hang on that for a second. All right, so eventually Catherine and Marie left the business to raise their families, and Ranzoni continued their expansion with the help of Emanuel's three sons. And again, they were Emanuel Jr., he became executive vice president, Angelo Ranzoni, uh, my grandfather was vice president of production, and the youngest son, Raymond, became vice president of sales. And this is the period that saw the creation of that wet right blue packaging. Within 25 years, um, uh, increasing demand led to the construction of a third Ronzoni plant. This large modern structure, actually the most modern of the time, uh, man uh, pasta manufacturing plant. If you remember what it looked like, this this is uh, an artist's conception. And later on, they built out this floor, and they built like silo stuff in the back, and the rail cars used to come in, and they would uh, you know uh, drop off the semolina. And there's the letters outside. The first in the industry to switch from that batch by batch method where they used to mix it up in the thing and pour it into the machine to what they call continuous production. Um, and under batch by batch you could produce about 200 pounds an hour, but when everything got automated you could reach to about 1,000 pounds an hour. And just by way of comparison, today in our, in our modern era, I have an authority from my father who kind of keeps up on these kind of things, that they can go between three and 6,000 pounds an hour. That's good. Yeah, Ranzoni was also the first plant to um, to set up the first continuing drying system for pasta, too. All right. To take note of the fact that there's increasing demand for authentic Italian-style sauce to go home their macaroni, the Ranzoni's purchased a small sauce manufacturing business located in the heart of Brooklyn in 1965. This operation became the springboard for Ranzoni Foods Incorporated, an ultra-modern production facility that began operation in Hicksville, Long Island in 1968. And that's where they made the first frozen food that they produced. And that came out around 1975. Ranzoni soda body in England. Ranzoni is so good. And uh, we can, family cannot take credit for this. This was developed by the Emil Mogul ad agency, Ranzoni, in the late 1950s. Uh, you know, this is when you watch that uh, show Mad Men. That's, that's oh, yeah. this era 
uh, you know, that, uh, that these guys were doing this. And the slogan became, became so popular, it even made its way onto items like birthday cards. So now, uh, Emmanuel Jr. and Angela and Raymond each had two sons who, after completing college in the late 50s and early 60s, began to run the business from the bottom up. Alfred Ranzoni Sr., my father, became the vice president of production. And um, his brother Emmanuel became vice president of shipping. That's him all the way in the back there. Raymond became vice president of sales. I don't see the picture there. Um, Richard, the eldest son of Emmanuel Jr., became vice president. That's Richard right there. And Ralph became controller and the office manager. That's Ralph back there. And Emmanuel Jr.'s second son became secretary of the parent company and was casting up his father in 81, 1981, assumed the duties of president. That's my uncle Bob and right there. So that's Jr. Uh, just to wrap up, as Manzoni approached the seventh decade of existence, its products could be found over 25 metropolitan areas across the continent of the United States, in addition to Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Uh, the company, again, employed nearly 400 people in the plant in Long Island City alone. Uh, it had become a household name. The rapidly changing conditions in American and world economies and corporate America would soon present the challenges that Emmanuel Manzoni Sr were probably not have foreseen. In the 1980s, Manzoni and other family-owned pasta manufacturers began to face tough competition from Italian brands that received generous financial assistance from the Italian government, which subsidized both the importation of American Durham semolina and manufacturing companies themselves. Uh, the Italians were delivering a quality product and often at a competitive or lower price, and Italian brands became more and more popular with American consumers. The other thing that began to happen was the growing interest of large food conglomerates like Borden's, Kraft, and General Foods in the pasta business. Relatively small family-owned enterprises like Ranzoni found it increasingly difficult to compete with these giants. And one by one, the small family-owned pasta manufacturers uh, sold out to the conglomerates. Uh, after long and careful consideration of the valuable options, uh, Ranzoni as a family, and you know, the board was had a lot of different family members on it, decided that it would be in the overall best interest of the family to sell the company as well. So in 1984, Ranzoni became part of the General Foods Corporation. The family thought that this was the best option because General Foods had done much to preserve the quality and reputation of other brand names such as Maxwell House Coffee, Jell-O, Oscar Meyer, and Entenmann's. Uh, however, in 1989, Ranzoni was sold uh, to uh, Philip Morris. And then after that, Philip Morris sold to the Hershey Corporation. And it was under Hershey's own ownership that the decision was made to shut down the plant at 5002 Northern Boulevard. And around July 1st, 1993 or so, that plant was torn down. And today there's a Home Depot on the site. In 1999, Hershey spun off its pasta division and uh, reorganized as a privately held New World Pasta Company, which still owns the Ranzoni brand today, as well as other well-known brands like Prince, Skinner, Anderson, and Georgia. Uh, that concludes the formal part of my presentation. Next door, we walk the world to open Ranzoni, I'm sure. And, and this, is a, this is just a remarkable story. But it, and it's, a, it's a bittersweet story. It's a very bittersweet story. We're, we're, we're grateful to have you. We're great. I guess now it's part of the Italian American Museum, which is what, unfortunately, a lot of our family legacies have become. Um, the quality, the excellence that is Italian, the visual zoning that is all of our families. Um, unfortunately, when it becomes corporate, things, things happen. The Italian model of business, the 300 person factory, whether it's in Bologna or it's in Long Island City, is excellent. When we get beyond that model, we have problems. I believe, because I'm a purist, that people are going to be willing to pay the extra price for the quality that comes from those small companies, you know, family-owned businesses. And hopefully then that it goes back again. And I'd love to see those other come back again. Under your leadership. Thank you all very much for the delicious dishes you're seeing were prepared with a very special brand of pasta. Pasta made from the finest durum wheat money can buy, because it makes an important difference in taste. 
Pasta made with such care, you get perfect results every time you cook it. If this pasta is so special, you need a special occasion to serve it. Uh-huh. This is Ranzoni. Serve it as often as you like, because although Ranzoni is a premium pasta, it's still a very economical meal. Ranzoni premium pasta. It is indeed fortunate that Ranzoni spaghetti is now available to us non-Italian so that we may serve it more often during this tight money crisis. Right. Now we've all fought long and hard to get Ranzoni because it is a superior pasta, the one the Italians prefer. And according to the famous Italian chef, Al Dente... Oh, right. <laughs> Al Dente isn't a man's name. It's Italian for spaghetti that's cooked firm. Are you sure? Mm. Well, that's too bad. I had intended to invite Mr. Dente to come here and speak about authentic Italian cooking. The right, old boy. If we cannot get this, Mr. Dente, how about that little chap whose name I always see on menus? Little chap? Yes. Shrimp? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's not coming. Look. Bronzoni is so good, even non-Italians can taste the difference.